And if you aren't sure what your facts are, your story is absolutely filling your brain, take the time to think them through before you enter the crucial conversation. Take the time to sort out facts from conclusions. Gathering the facts is the homework required for crucial conversations. Facts are the least insulting. If you do want to share your story, don't start with it. Your story, particularly if it has led to a rather ugly conclusion, could easily surprise and insult others. It could kill safety in one rash, ill-conceived sentence. Brian, I'd like to talk to you about your leadership style. You micromanage me, and it's starting to drive me nuts. Fernando, what? I ask you if you're going to be done on time, and you lay into me with... If you start with your story, and in so doing kill safety, you may never actually get to the facts. Begin your path with facts. In order to talk about your stories, you need to lead the others involved down your path to action. Let them experience your path from the beginning to the end, and not from the end to, well, to wherever it takes you. Let others see your experience from your point of view, starting with your facts. This way, when you do talk about what you're starting to conclude, they'll understand why. First the facts, then the story. And then make sure that as you explain your story, you tell it as a possible story, not as a concrete fact. Brian, since I started working here, you've asked to meet with me twice a day. That's more than with anyone else. You have also asked me to pass all of my ideas by you before I include them in a project. The facts. Fernando. What's your point? Brian, I'm not sure that you're intending to send this message, but I'm beginning to wonder if you don't trust me. Maybe you think I'm not up to the job or that I'll get you into trouble. Is that what's going on? The possible story. Fernando, really, I was merely trying to give you a chance to get my input before you got too far down the path on a project. The last guy I worked with was constantly taking his project to near completion, only to learn that he'd left out a key element. I'm trying to avoid surprises. Earn the right to share your story by starting with your facts. Facts lay the groundwork for all delicate conversations. Tell your story. Sharing your story can be tricky, even if you started with your facts. The other person can still become defensive when you move from facts to stories. After all, you're sharing potentially unflattering conclusions and judgments. Why share your story in the first place? Because facts alone are rarely worth mentioning. It's the facts plus the conclusion that call for a face-to-face -face discussion. In addition, if you simply mention the facts, the other person may not understand the severity of the implications. For example, I noticed that you had company software in your briefcase. Yep, that's the beauty of software. It's portable. That particular software is proprietary. It ought to be. Our future depends on it. Well, my understanding is that it's not supposed to go home. Of course not. That's how people steal it. Sounds like it's time for a conclusion. I was wondering what the software is doing in your briefcase. It looks like you're taking it home. Is that what's going on here? It takes confidence. To be honest, it can be difficult to share negative conclusions and unattractive judgments. For example, I'm wondering if you're a thief. It takes confidence to share such a potentially inflammatory story. However, if you've done your homework by thinking through the facts behind your story, you'll realize that you are drawing a reasonable, rational, and decent conclusion, one that deserves hearing. And by starting with the facts, you've laid the groundwork. By thinking through the facts and then leading with them, you're much more likely to have the confidence you need to add controversial and vitally important meaning to the shared pool. Don't pile it on. Sometimes we lack the confidence to speak up, so we let problems simmer for a long time. Given the chance, we generate a whole arsenal of unflattering conclusions. For example, you're about to hold a crucial conversation with your child's second-grade teacher. The teacher wants to hold your daughter back a year. You want your daughter to advance right along with her age group. This is what's going on in your head. I can't believe this. This teacher is straight out of college, and she wants to hold Debbie back? To be perfectly frank, I don't think she gives much weight to the stigma of being held back. Worse still, she's quoting the recommendation of the school psychologist. The guy's a real idiot. I've met him, and I wouldn't trust him with a common cold. I'm not going to let these two morons push me around. 
Which of these insulting conclusions or judgments should you share? Certainly not the entire menagerie of unflattering tales. In fact, you're going to need to work on this villain story before you have any hope of healthy dialogue. As you do, your story begins to sound more like this. Note the careful choice of terms. After all, it is your story, not the facts. When I first heard your recommendation, my initial reaction was to oppose your decision. But after thinking about it, I've realized I could be wrong. I realized I don't really have any experience about what's best for Debbie in this situation, only fears about the stigma of being held back. I know it's a complex issue. I'd like to talk about how both of us can more objectively weigh this decision. Look for safety problems. As you share your story, watch for signs that safety is deteriorating. If people start becoming defensive or appear to be insulted, step out of the conversation and rebuild safety by contrasting. Use contrasting. Here's how it works. I know you care a great deal about my daughter, and I'm confident you're well-trained. That's not my concern at all. I know you want to do what's best for Debbie, and I do too. My only issue is that this is an ambiguous decision with huge implications for the rest of her life. Be careful not to apologize for your views. Remember, the goal of contrasting is not to water down your message, but to be sure that people don't hear more than you intend. Be confident enough to share what you really want to express. Ask for others' paths. We mentioned that the key to sharing sensitive ideas is a blend of confidence and humility. We express our confidence by sharing our facts and stories clearly. We demonstrate our humility by then asking others to share their views and meaning it. So once you've shared your point of view, facts and stories alike, invite others to do the same. If your goal is to keep expanding the pool of meaning rather than to be right, to make the best decision rather than to get your way, then you'll willingly listen to other views. By being open to learning, we are demonstrating humility at its best. For example, ask yourself, what does the school teacher think? Is my boss really intending to micromanage me? Is my spouse really having an affair? To find out others' views on the matter, encourage them to express their facts, stories, and feelings. Then carefully listen to what they have to say. Equally important, be willing to abandon or reshape your story as more information pours into the pool of shared meaning. The How Skills Talk Tentatively if you look back at the vignettes we've shared so far, you'll note that we were careful to describe both facts and stories in a tentative or non-dogmatic way. For example, I was wondering why... Talking tentatively simply means that we tell our story as a story, rather than disguising it as a hard fact. Perhaps you were unaware, suggests that you're not absolutely certain. In my opinion, says you're sharing an opinion and no more. When sharing a story, strike a blend between confidence and humility. Share in a way that expresses appropriate confidence in your conclusion, while demonstrating that, if called for, you want your conclusions challenged. To do so, change the fact is to, in my opinion. Swap everyone knows that for, I've talked to three of our suppliers who think that. Soften, it's clear to me, to, I'm beginning to wonder if. Why soften the message? Because we're trying to add meaning to the pool, not force it down other people's throats. If we're too forceful, the information won't make it into the pool. One of the ironies of dialogue is that when talking with those holding opposing opinions, the more convinced and forceful you act, the more resistant others become. Speaking in absolute and overstated terms does not increase your influence. It decreases it. The converse is also true. The more tentatively you speak, the more open people become to your opinions. Now, this raises an interesting question. Individuals have asked us if being tentative is akin to being manipulative. You're pretending to be uncertain about your opinion in order to help others consider it less defensively. Our answer to this is an unequivocal no. If you are faking tentativeness, you are not in dialogue. The reason we should speak tentatively is because we, indeed, are not certain that our opinions represent absolute truth or our understanding of the facts is complete and perfect. You should never pretend to be less confident than you are. But likewise, 
you should not pretend to be more confident than your limited capacity allows. Our observations could be faulty. Our stories, well, they're only educated guesses. Tentative, not wimpy. Some people are so worried about being too forceful or pushy that they err in the other direction. They wimp out by making still another fool's choice. They figure that the only safe way to share touchy data is to act as if it's not important. I know this is probably not true, or call me crazy, but... When you begin with a complete disclaimer and do it in a tone that suggests you're consumed with doubt, you do the message a disservice. It's one thing to be humble and open. It's quite another to be clinically uncertain. Use language that says you're sharing an opinion, not language that says you're a nervous wreck. A good story. The Goldilocks test. To get a feel for how to best share your story, making sure that you're neither too hard nor too soft, consider the following examples. Too soft. This is probably stupid, but too hard. How come you ripped us off? Just right. It's starting to look like you're taking this home for your own use. Is that right? Too soft. I'm ashamed to even mention this, but too hard. Just when did you start using hard drugs? Just right. It's leading me to conclude that you're starting to use drugs. You have another explanation that I'm missing here? Too soft. It's probably my fault, but too hard. You wouldn't trust your own mother to make a one-minute egg. Just right. I'm starting to feel like you don't trust me. Is that what's going on here? If so, I'd like to know what I did to lose your trust. Too soft. Maybe I'm just oversexed or something, but too hard. If you don't find a way to pick up the frequency, I'm walking. Just right. I don't think you're intending this, but I'm beginning to feel rejected. Encourage testing. When you ask others to share their paths, how you phrase your invitation makes a big difference. Not only should you invite others to talk, but you have to do so in a way that makes it clear that no matter how controversial their ideas might be, you want to hear them. Others need to feel safe sharing their observations and stories, particularly if they differ from yours. Otherwise, they don't speak up, and you can't test the accuracy and relevance of your views. Safety becomes particularly important when you're having a crucial conversation with people who might move to silence. Some people make fool's choices in these circumstances. They worry that if they share their true opinions, others will clam up. So they choose between speaking their minds and hearing others out. But the best at dialogue don't choose. They do both. They understand that the only limit to how strongly you can express your opinion is your willingness to be equally vigorous in encouraging others to challenge it. Invite opposing views. So, if you think others may be hesitant, make it clear that you want to hear their views, no matter how different. If others disagree, so much the better. If what they have to say is controversial or even touchy, respect them for finding the courage to express what they're thinking. If they have different facts or stories, you need to hear them to help complete the picture. Make sure they have the opportunity to share by actively inviting them to do so. Does anyone see it differently? What am I missing here? I'd really like to hear the other side of this story. Mean it. Sometimes people offer an invitation that sounds more like a threat than a legitimate call for opinions. Well, that's how I see it. Nobody disagrees, do they? Don't turn an invitation into a veiled threat. Invite people with both words and tone that says, I really want to hear from you. For instance, I know people have been reluctant to speak up about this, but I would really love to hear from everyone. Or, I know there are at least two sides to this story. Could we hear differing views now? What problems could this decision cause us? Play devil's advocate. Occasionally, you can tell that others are not buying into your facts or story but they're not speaking up either. You've sincerely invited them, even encouraged differing views, but nobody says anything. To help grease the skids, play devil's advocate. Model disagreeing by disagreeing with your own view. Maybe I'm wrong here. What if the opposite is true? What if the reason sales have dropped is because? Do it until your motive becomes obvious. 
At times, particularly if you are in a position of authority, even being appropriately tentative doesn't prevent others from suspecting you want them to simply agree with you or that you're inviting them into a beating. This is particularly true when former bosses or authority figures have gently invited them to speak and then punished them for doing so. This is where the skill of encouraging testing comes into play. You can argue as vigorously as you want for your point of view, provided you are even more vigorous at encouraging, even pleading with others, to disprove it. The real test of whether your motive is to win a debate or engage in real dialogue is the degree to which you encourage testing. Back to the motel. To see how all of the state skills fit together in a touchy conversation, let's return to the motel bill. Only this time, Carol does a far better job of bringing up a delicate issue. Bob. Hi, honey. How was your day? Carol. Not so good. Bob. Why is that? Carol. I was checking our credit card bill, and I noticed a charge of $48 for the Goodnight Motel down the street. Here she shares facts. Bob. Boy, that sounds wrong. Carol. It sure does. Bob. Well, don't worry. I'll check into it one day when I'm going by. Carol. I'd feel better if we checked right now. Bob. Really? It's less than 50 bucks. It can wait. Carol. It's not the money that has me worried. Bob. You're worried? Carol. It's a motel down the street. You know, that's how my sister found out that Phil was having an affair. She found a suspicious hotel bill. Here, she shares her story, tentatively. I don't have anything to worry about, do I? What do you think is going on with this bill? Asks for others, Pat. Bob. I don't know, but you certainly don't have anything to worry about me. Carol. I know that you've given me no reason to question your fidelity. I don't really believe that you're having an affair. Notice here Carol is contrasting. And she continues. It's just that it might help put my mind to rest if we were to check on this right now. Would that bother you? Encourages testing. Bob, not at all. Let's give them a call and find out what's going on. When this conversation actually did take place, it sounded exactly like the one portrayed above. The suspicious spouse avoided nasty accusations and ugly stories, shared facts, and then tentatively shared a possible conclusion. As it turns out, the couple had gone out to a Chinese restaurant earlier that month. The owner of the restaurant also owned the motel and used the same credit card and printing machine at both establishments. Oops. By tentatively sharing a story rather than attacking, name-calling, and threatening, the worried spouse averted a huge battle, and the couple's relationship was strengthened at a time when it could easily have been damaged. To watch a riveting video that demonstrates both the need for and the benefits of state skills, go to crucialconversations.com slash exclusive. Strong Belief Now let's turn our attention to another communication challenge. This time you're not offering delicate feedback or iffy stories, you're merely going to step into an argument and advocate your point of view. It's the kind of thing you do all the time. You do it at home, you do it at work, and yes, you've even been known to fire off an opinion or two while standing in line for a voting booth. Unfortunately, as stakes rise and others argue differing views, and you just know in your heart of hearts that you're right and they're wrong, you start pushing too hard. You simply have to win. There's too much at risk, and only you have the right ideas. Left to their own devices, others will mess things up. So, when you care a great deal and are sure of your views, you don't merely speak, you try to force your opinions into the pool of meaning. You know, drown people in the truth. Quite naturally, others resist. You, in turn, push even harder. As consultants, we, the authors, watch this kind of thing happen all the time. For instance, seated around the table is a group of leaders who are starting to debate an important topic. First, someone hints that she's the only one with any real insight. Then someone else starts tossing out facts like so many poisonous darts. Another, it just so happens, someone with critical information, retreats into silence. As emotions rise, words that were once carefully chosen and tentatively delivered are now spouted with an absolute certainty that is typically reserved for claims that are nailed to church doors or carved on stone tablets. In the end, nobody is listening, everyone is committed to silence or violence, and the pool of shared meaning remains parched and tainted. Nobody wins. 
How did we get like this? It starts with a story. When we feel the need to push our ideas on others, it's generally because we believe we're right and everyone else is wrong. There's no need to expand the pool of meaning because we own the pool. We also firmly believe it's our duty to fight for the truth that we're holding. It's the honorable thing to do. It's what people of character do. Of course, others aren't exactly villains in this story. They simply don't know any better. We, on the other hand, are modern-day heroes crusading against naivete and tunnel vision. We feel justified in using dirty tricks. Once we're convinced that it's our duty to fight for the truth, we start pulling out the big guns. We use debating tricks that we've picked up throughout the years. Chief among them is the ability to stack the deck. We cite information that supports our ideas while hiding or discrediting anything that doesn't. Then we spice things up with exaggeration. Everyone knows that this is the only way to go. When this doesn't work, we lace our language with inflammatory terms. All right-thinking people would agree with me. From there, we employ any number of dirty tricks. We appeal to authority. Well, that's what the boss thinks. We attack the person. You're not so naive as to actually believe that. We draw hasty generalizations. If it happened in our overseas operation, it'll happen here for sure. We attack a straw man. Sure, we can follow your plan if we want to offend our top customers and lose the business. And again, the harder we try and the more forceful and nasty our tactics, the greater the resistance we create, the worse the results and the more battered our relationships. How do we change? The solution to employing excessive advocacy is actually rather simple. If you can just bring yourself to do it. When you find yourself just dying to convince others that your way is best, back off your current attack and think about what you really want for yourself, others, and the relationship. Then ask yourself, how would I behave if these were the results I really wanted? When your adrenaline level gets below the .05 legal limit, you'll be able to use your state skills. First, learn to look. Watch for the moment when people start to resist you. Perhaps they begin to raise their volume and or overstate the facts behind their views in reaction to your tactics, or perhaps they retreat into silence. Turn your attention away from the topic, no matter how important, and onto yourself. Are you leaning forward? Are you speaking more loudly? Are you starting to try to win? Are you speaking in lengthy monologues and using dirty tricks? Remember, the more you care about an issue, the less likely you are to be on your best behavior. Second, tone down your approach. Open yourself up to the belief that others might have something to say, and better still, they might even hold a piece of the puzzle, and then ask them for their views. Of course, this isn't easy. Backing off when we care the most is so counterintuitive that most of us have trouble doing so. It's not easy to soften your language when you're positive about something. And who wants to ask for other views when you know they're wrong? That's positively nuts. In fact, it can feel disingenuous to be tentative when your own strong belief is being brought into question. Of course, when you watch others shift from healthy dialogue to forcing their way on others, it's obvious that if they don't back off, nobody will buy in. That's when you're watching others. On the other hand, when we ourselves are pushing hard, it's the correct thing to do, right? Let's face it. When it comes to our strongest views, passion can be our enemy. Of course, feeling strongly about something isn't bad in and of itself. It's okay to have strong opinions. The problem comes when we try to express them. For instance, when we believe strongly in a concept or a cause, our emotions kick in and we start trying to force our way onto others. As our emotions kick in, our ideas no longer flow smoothly and gently into the pool. Instead, our thoughts shoot out of our mouths like water out of a raging fire hydrant. And guess what? Others become defensive. When this happens, when our emotions turn our ideas into a harsh and painful stream of thoughts, our honest passion kills the argument rather than supports it. Catch yourself. So what's a person to do? Catch yourself before you launch into a monologue. Realize that if you're starting to feel indignant or if you can't figure out why others don't buy in, after all, it's so obvious to you, recognize that you're starting to enter dangerous territory. Back off your harsh and conclusive language, but don't back off your belief. Hold to your belief. Merely soften your approach. 
My Crucial Conversation, Lori A. Three years ago, my teenage daughter was diagnosed as bipolar. The manic highs and lows are incredibly frightening because they often turn violent, and the abyss of depression after a violent episode made me and my husband truly fear for our daughter's life. With bipolar disorders, it takes a very long time to get the right combination of drugs to level the patient. Patients also have to be extremely consistent with their prescriptions. Of course, non-prescription drugs and alcohol are forbidden. During this difficult time, we had the police at our house to defuse the violence. We watched helplessly as she used drugs, alcohol, and cut herself. She stopped going to school. We had her hospitalized. We prayed a lot. The good news is that I began using my crucial conversation skills in manic highs and lows, and it worked. The contrasting statement was extremely effective and still is in diffusing her anger and sadness. Later on, after she was level, the state my path skills became a literal lifesaver. I noticed that if I was careful to remove my judgments when I shared my concerns and just state this factually, then encourage her to share her views, she could hear me much easier. With the help of crucial conversations, I was able to maintain a relationship with my daughter during a time in her life when she was hard to reach. Since her diagnosis and treatment, she has truly turned her life around. She takes her medication, changed her friendships, goes to therapy, asks for support from her teachers when she is feeling stressed in school, volunteers with special needs kids at church, and most importantly, talks to my husband and to me. As we face more challenges ahead, I can and will continue to use these skills. In many ways, I believe you have helped us save her. Lori A. Summary, State My Path When you have a tough message to share, or when you are so convinced of your own rightness that you may push too hard, remember to state your path. First, share your facts. Start with the least controversial, most persuasive elements from your path to action. Second, tell your story. Explain what you're beginning to conclude. Third, ask for others' paths. Encourage others to share both their facts and their stories. Fourth, talk tentatively. State your story as a story. Don't disguise it as a fact. And fifth, encourage testing. Make it safe for others to express differing or even opposing views. Chapter 8. Explore Others' Paths. How to Listen When Others Blow Up or Clam Up. One of the best ways to persuade others is with your ears by listening to them. Dean Rusk Over the past few months, your daughter Wendy has started to date a guy who looks like he's about ten minutes away from a felony arrest. After only a few weeks of dating this rather interesting fellow, Wendy's clothing preference is now far too suggestive for your taste, and she routinely punctuates her language with expletives. When you carefully try to talk to her about these recent changes, she shouts accusations and insults and then withdraws to her room where she sulks for hours on end. Now what? Should you do something, given that you're not the one going to silence or violence? When others do damage to the pool of meaning by clamming up, refusing to speak their minds, or blowing up, communicating in a way that is abusive and insulting, is there something you can do to get them back to dialogue? The answer is a resounding... It depends. If you want to let a sleeping dog lie, or in this case a potential train wreck go unattended, then say nothing. It's the other person who seems to have something to say but refuses to open up. It's the other person who's blown a cork. Run for cover. You can't take responsibility for someone else's thoughts and feelings, right? Then again, you'll never work through your differences until all parties freely add to the pool of meaning. That requires the people who are blowing up or clamming up to participate as well. And while it's true that you can't force others to dialogue, you can take steps to make it safer for them to do so. After all, that's why they've sought the security of silence or violence in the first place. They're afraid that dialogue will make them vulnerable. Somehow they believe that if they engage in real conversation with you, bad things will happen to them. Your daughter, for instance, believes that if she talks with you, She'll be lectured, grounded, and cut off from the only guy who seems to care about her. Restoring safety is your greatest hope to get your relationship back on track. Explore Others' Paths 
In chapter 5, we recommended that whenever you notice safety is at risk, you should step out of the conversation and restore it. When you have offended others through a thoughtless act, apologize. Or if someone has misunderstood your intent, use contrasting. Explain what you do and don't intend. Finally, if you're simply at odds, find a mutual purpose. Now we add one more skill. Explore others' paths. Since we've added a model of what's going on inside another person's head, the path to action, we now have a whole new tool for helping others feel safe. If we can find a way to let others know that it's okay to share their path to action, their facts, and, yes, even their nasty stories and ugly feelings, then they'll be more likely to open up. But what does it take? Start with heart. Get ready to listen. Be sincere. To get others' facts and stories into the pool of meaning, we have to invite them to share what's on their minds. We'll look at how to do this in a minute. For now, let's highlight the point that when you do invite people to share their views, you must mean it. For example, consider the following incident. A patient is exiting a health care facility. The desk attendant can tell that she is a bit uneasy and maybe even dissatisfied. Did everything go all right with the procedure? The clerk asks. Mostly, the patient replies. If ever there was a hint that something was wrong, the term mostly has to be it. Good, the clerk abruptly responds and then follows with a resounding, Next! This is a classic case of pretending to be interested. It falls under the how-are-you-today category of inquiries, meaning, please don't say anything of substance, I'm really just making small talk. When you ask people to open up, be prepared to listen. Be curious. When you do want to hear from others, and you should because it adds to the pool of meaning, the best way to get at the truth is by making it safe for them to express the stories that are moving them to either silence or violence. This means that at the very moment when most people become furious, we need to become curious. Rather than respond in kind, we need to wonder what's behind the ruckus. But how? How can we possibly act curious when others are either attacking us or heading for cover? People who routinely seek to find out why others are feeling unsafe do so because they have learned that getting at the source of fear and discomfort is the best way to return to dialogue. Either they've seen others do it, or they've stumbled on the formula themselves. Either way, they realize that the cure to silence or violence isn't to respond in kind, but to get at the underlying source. This calls for genuine curiosity at a time when you're likely to be feeling frustrated or angry. To help turn your visceral tendency to respond in kind into genuine curiosity, look for opportunities to be curious. Start with a situation where you observe someone becoming emotional and you're still under control, such as a meeting when you're not personally under attack and are less likely to get hooked. Do your best to get at the person's source of fear or anger. Look for chances to turn on your curiosity rather than kickstart your adrenaline. To illustrate what can happen as we exercise our curiosity, let's return to our nervous patient. Clerk, did everything go all right with the procedure? Patient, mostly. Clerk, it sounds like you had a problem of some kind, is that right? Patient, I'll say, it hurt quite a bit, and besides, isn't the doctor like, uh, way too old? In this case, the patient is reluctant to speak up. Perhaps if she shares her honest opinion, she will insult the doctor, or maybe the loyal staff members will become offended. To deal with the problem, the desk attendant lets the patient know, as much with his tone as with his words, that it's safe to talk, and she opens up. Stay curious. When people begin to share their volatile stories and feelings, we now face the risk of pulling out our own victim, villain, and helpless stories to help us explain why they're saying what they're saying. Unfortunately, since it's rarely fun to hear other people's unflattering stories, we begin to assign negative motives to them for telling the stories. For example, Clerk, Well, aren't you the ungrateful one? The kind doctor devotes his whole life to helping people, and now that he's a little gray around the edges, you want to send him out to pasture. To avoid overreacting to others' stories, stay curious. Give your brain a problem to stay focused on. Ask, why would a reasonable, 
rational and decent person say this? This question keeps you retracing the other person's path to action until you see how it all fits together. And in most cases, you end up seeing that under the circumstances, the individual in question drew a fairly reasonable conclusion. Be patient. When others are acting out their feelings and opinions through silence or violence, it's a good bet they're starting to feel the effects of adrenaline. Even if we do our best to safely and effectively respond to the other person's verbal attack, we still have to face up to the fact that it's going to take a little while for him or her to settle down. Say, for example, that a friend dumps out an ugly story and you treat it with respect and continue on with the conversation. Even if the two of you now share a similar view, it may seem like your friend is still pushing too hard. While it's natural to move quickly from one thought to the next, strong emotions take a while to subside. Once the chemicals that fuel emotions are released, they hang around in the bloodstream for a time, in some cases long after thoughts have changed. So be patient when exploring how others think and feel. Encourage them to share their path and then wait for their emotions to catch up with the safety that you've created. Encourage others to retrace their path. Once you've decided to maintain a curious approach, it's time to help the other person retrace his or her path to action. Unfortunately, most of us fail to do so. That's because when others start playing silence or violence games, we're joining the conversation at the end of their path to action. They've seen and heard things, told themselves a story or two, generated a feeling, possibly a mix of fear and anger or disappointment, and now they're starting to act out their story. That's where we come in. Now, even though we may be hearing their first words, we're coming in somewhere near the end of their path. On the path to action model, we're seeing the action at the end of the path. Remember how our path to action model is composed. See and hear, tell a story, feel, and act. Every sentence has a history. To get a feel for how complicated and unnerving this process is, remember how you felt the last time your favorite mystery show started late because a football game ran long. As the game wraps up, the screen crossfades from a trio of announcers to a starlet standing over a murder victim. Along the bottom of the screen are the discomforting words, We now join this program already in progress. You shake the remote in exasperation. You've missed the entire setup. For the rest of the program, you end up guessing about key facts. What happened before you joined in? Crucial conversations can be similarly mysterious and frustrating. When others are in either silence or violence, we're actually joining their path to action already in progress. Consequently, we've already missed the foundation of the story and we're confused. If we're not careful, we can become defensive. After all, not only are we joining late, but we're also joining at a time when the other person is starting to act offensively. Break the cycle. And then guess what happens? When we're on the receiving end of someone's retributions, accusations, and cheap shots, rarely do we think, my, what an interesting story he or she must have told. What do you suppose led to that? Instead, we match this unhealthy behavior. Our genetically shaped, eons-old defense mechanisms kick in, and we create our own hasty and ugly path to action. People who know better cut this dangerous cycle by stepping out of the interaction and making it safe for the other person to talk about his or her path to action. They perform this feat by encouraging him or her to move away from harsh feelings and knee-jerk reactions and toward the root cause. In essence, they retrace the other person's path to action together. At their encouragement, the other person moves from his or her emotions to what he or she concluded to what he or she observed. When we help others retrace their path to its origins, not only do we help curb our reaction, but we also return to the place where the feelings can be resolved, at the source, that is, the facts and the story behind the emotion. Inquiry Skills When So far we've suggested that when other people appear to have a story to tell and facts to share, it's our job to invite them to do so. Our cues are simple. Others are going to silence or violence. 
we can see that they're feeling upset, fearful, or angry. We can see that if we don't get at the source of their feelings, we'll end up suffering the effects of the feelings. These external reactions are our cues to do whatever it takes to help others retrace their paths to action. How? We've also suggested that whatever we do to invite the other person to open up and share his or her path, our invitation must be sincere. As hard as it sounds, we must be genuine in the face of hostility, fear, or even abuse, which leads us to the next question. What? What are we supposed to actually do? What does it take to get others to share their path, stories, and facts alike? In a word, it requires listening. In order for people to move from acting on their feelings to talking about their conclusions and observations, we must listen in a way that makes it safe for others to share their intimate thoughts. They must believe that when they share their thoughts, they won't offend others or be punished for speaking frankly. Ask, mirror, paraphrase, or prime. Amp. To encourage others to share their paths, we'll use four power listening tools that can help make it safe for other people to speak frankly. We call the four skills power listening tools because they are best remembered with the acronym AMP, A-M-P-P, Ask, Mirror, Paraphrase, and Prime. Luckily, the tools work for both silence and violent schemes. Ask to get things rolling. The easiest and most straightforward way to encourage others to share their path to action is simply to invite them to express themselves. For example, often all it takes to break an impasse is to seek to understand others' views. When we show genuine interest, people feel less compelled to use silence or violence. For example, Do you like my new dress, or are you going to call the modesty police? Wendy smirks. What do you mean, you ask? I'd like to hear your concerns. If you're willing to stop filling the pool with your meaning and step back and invite the other person to talk about his or her view, it can go a long way toward breaking the downward spiral and getting to the source of the problem. Common invitations include, What's going on? I'd really like to hear your opinion on this. Please let me know if you see it differently. Don't worry about hurting my feelings. I really want to hear your thoughts. Mirror to confirm feelings. If asking others to share their path doesn't open things up, mirroring can help build more safety. In mirroring, we take the portion of the other person's path to action we have access to and make it safe for him or her to discuss it. All we have so far are actions and some hints about the other person's emotions, so we start there. When we mirror, as the name suggests, we play the role of mirror by describing how they look or act. Although we may not understand other stories or facts, we can see their actions and reflect them back. Mirroring is most useful when another person's tone of voice or gestures, hints about the emotions behind them, are inconsistent with his or her words. For example, don't worry, I'm fine. But the person in question is saying this with a look and tone that suggests he is actually quite upset. He's frowning, looking around, and sort of kicking at the ground. Really? From the way you're saying that, it doesn't sound like you are. We explain that while the person may be saying one thing, his or her tone of voice or body posture suggests something else. In doing so, by staying with the observed actions, we show both respect and concern for him or her. When reflecting back your observations, take care to manage your tone of voice and delivery. It is not the fact that we are acknowledging others' emotions that create safety. We create safety when our tone of voice says we're okay with them feeling the way they're feeling. If we do this well, they may conclude that rather than acting out their emotions, they can confidently talk them out with us instead. So as we describe what we see, we have to do so calmly. If we act upset or as if we're not going to like what others say, we don't build safety. We confirm their suspicions that they need to remain silent. Examples of mirroring include, You say you're okay, but by the tone of your voice, you seem upset. You seem angry at me. You look nervous about confronting him. Are you sure you're willing to do it? Paraphrase to acknowledge the story. Asking 
and mirroring may help you get part of the other person's story out into the open. When you get a clue about why the person is feeling as he or she does, you can build additional safety by paraphrasing what you've heard. Be careful not to simply parrot back what was said. Instead, put the message in your own words, usually in an abbreviated form. Let's see if I've got this right. You're upset because I've voiced my concern about some of the clothes you wear, and this seems controlling or old-fashioned to you. The key to paraphrasing, as with mirroring, is to remain calm and collected. Our goal is to make it safe, not to act horrified and suggest that the conversation is about to turn ugly. Stay focused on figuring out how a reasonable, rational, and decent person could have created this path to action. This will help you keep from becoming angry or defensive. Simply rephrase what the person has said and do it in a way that suggests that it's okay, you're trying to understand, and it's safe for him or her to talk candidly. Don't push too hard. Let's see where we are. We can tell that another person has more to share than he or she is currently sharing. He or she is going to silence or violence, and we want to know why. We want to get back to the source, the facts, where we can solve the problem. To encourage the person to share, we've tried three listening tools. We've asked, mirrored, and paraphrased. The person is still upset, but isn't explaining his or her stories or facts. Now what? At this point, we may want to back off. After a while, our attempts to make it safe for others can start feeling as if we're pestering or prying. If we push too hard, we violate both purpose and respect. Others may think our purpose is merely to extract what we want from them and conclude that we don't care about them personally. So instead, we back off. Rather than trying to get to the source of the other person's emotions, we either gracefully exit or ask what he or she wants to see happen. Asking people what they want helps them engage their brains in a way that moves to problem-solving and away from either attacking or avoiding. It also helps reveal what they think the cause of the problem is. Prime, when you're getting nowhere. On the other hand, there are times when you may conclude that others would like to open up but still don't feel safe. Or maybe they're still in violence, haven't come down from the adrenaline, and aren't explaining why they're angry. When this is the case, you might want to try priming. Prime, when you believe that the other person still has something to share and might do so with a little more effort on your part. The power listening term priming comes from the expression priming the pump. If you've ever worked on an old-fashioned hand pump, you understand the metaphor. With a pump, you often have to pour some water into it to get it running. Then it works just fine. When it comes to power listening, sometimes you have to offer your best guess at what the other person is thinking or feeling before you can expect him or her to do the same. You have to pour some meaning into the pool before the other person will respond in kind. A few years back, one of the authors was working with an executive team that had decided to add an afternoon shift to one of the company's work areas. The equipment wasn't being fully utilized, and the company couldn't afford to keep the area open without adding a three-to-midnight crew. This, of course, meant that the people currently working days would now have to rotate every two weeks to afternoons. It was a tortured but necessary choice. As the execs held a meeting to announce the unpopular change, the existing employees went silent. They were obviously unhappy, but nobody would say anything. The operations manager was afraid that people would misinterpret the company's actions as nothing more than a grab for more money. In truth, the area was losing money, but the decision was made with the current employees in mind. With no second shift, there would be no jobs. He also knew that asking people to rotate shifts and to be away from loved ones during the afternoon and evening would cause horrible burdens. As people sat silently fuming, the executive did his best to get them to talk so that they wouldn't walk away with unresolved feelings. He mirrored, I can see you're upset. Who wouldn't be? Is there anything we can do? Nothing. Finally, he primed. That is, he took his best guess at what they might be thinking, said it in a way that showed it was okay to talk about it, and then went on from there. Are you thinking that the only reason we're doing this is to make money? that maybe we don't care about your personal lives? After a brief pause, someone answered, Well, it sure looks like that. Do you have any idea how much trouble this is going to cause? Then someone else chimed in, and the discussion was off and running. 
Now, this is not the kind of thing you would do unless nothing else has worked. You really want to hear from others, and you have a very strong idea of what they're probably thinking. Priming is an act of good faith, taking risks, becoming vulnerable, and building safety in hopes that others will share their meaning. But what if they're wrong? Sometimes it feels dangerous to sincerely explore the views of someone whose path is wildly different from your own. He or she could be completely wrong, and we're acting calm and collected. This makes us nervous. To keep ourselves from feeling nervous while exploring others' paths, no matter how different or wrong they seem, remember, we're trying to understand their point of view, not necessarily agree with it or support it. Understanding doesn't equate with agreement. Sensitivity does equate to acquiescence. By taking steps to understand another person's path to action, we are promising that we'll accept their point of view. There will be plenty of time later for us to share our path as well. For now, we're merely trying to get at what others think in order to understand why they're feeling the way they're feeling and doing what they're doing. Exploring Wendy's Path Now, let's put the several skills together in a single interaction. We'll return to Wendy. She has just come home from a date with the guy who has you frightened. You yank the door open, pull Wendy into the house, and double-bolt your entrance. Then you talk. Sort of. Wendy. How could you embarrass me like that? I get one boy to like me, and now he'll never talk to me again. I hate you. You. That wasn't a boy. That was a future inmate. You're worth more than that. Why are you wasting your time with him? Wendy. You're ruining my life. Leave me alone. After Wendy's bedroom door slams shut, you drop down into a chair in the living room. Your emotions are running wild. You're terrified about what could happen if Wendy continues to see this guy. You're hurt that she said she hated you. You feel that your relationship with her is spiraling out of control. So you ask yourself, what do I really want? As you mull this question over, your motives change. The goals of controlling Wendy and defending your pride drop from the top to the bottom of your list. The goal that's now at the top looks a bit more inspiring. I want to understand what she's feeling. I want a good relationship with Wendy. And I want her to make choices that will make her happy. You're not sure if tonight is the best or worst time to talk, but you know that talking is the only path forward. So you give it a shot. You, tapping on door. Wendy? May I talk with you, please? Wendy. Whatever. You enter her room and sit on her bed. You. I'm really sorry for embarrassing you like that. That was a bad way to handle it. Here you apologize to build safety. Wendy. It's just that you do that a lot. It's like you want to control everything in my life. You. Can we talk about that? Here, you're asking. Wendy, sounding angry. It's no big deal. You're the parent, right? You. From the way you say that, it sounds like it is a big deal. Here, you're mirroring. I really would like to hear what makes you think I'm trying to control your life. Now you're asking. Wendy. What? So you can tell me more ways that I'm screwed up? I finally got one friend who accepts me, and you're trying to chase him away. You. So you feel like I don't approve of you, and your friend is one person who does. Notice that you're paraphrasing here. Wendy. It's not just you. All my friends have lots of boys who like them. Doug's the first guy who's even called me. I don't know. Never mind. You. I can see how you'd feel badly when others are getting attention from boys and you aren't. I'd probably feel the same way. Here you're paraphrasing. Wendy. Then how could you embarrass me like that? You. Honey, I'd like to take a stab at something here. I wonder if part of the reason you've started dressing differently and hanging out with different friends is because you're not feeling cared about and valued by boys, by your parents, and by others right now. Is that part of it? Notice that now you're priming. Wendy sits quietly for a long time. Why am I so ugly? I really work on how I look, but... 
From here, the conversation goes to the real issues. Parent and daughter discuss what's really going on, and both come to a better understanding of each other. Remember your ABCs. Let's say you did your level best to make it safe for the other person to talk. After asking, mirroring, paraphrasing, and eventually priming, the other person opened up and shared his or her path. It's now your turn to talk. But what if you disagree? Some of the other person's facts are wrong, and his or her stories are completely fouled up. Well, at least they're a lot different from the story you've been telling. Now what? Agree. As you watch families and work groups take part in heated debates, it's common to notice a rather intriguing phenomenon. Although the various parties you're observing are violently arguing, in truth, they're in violent agreement. They actually agree on every important point, but they're still fighting. They found a way to turn subtle differences into a raging debate. For example, last night your teenage son broke his curfew again. You and your spouse have spent the morning arguing about the infraction. Last time James came in late, you agreed to ground him, but today you're upset because it seems like your spouse is backpedaling by suggesting that James still be able to attend a football camp this week. Turns out it was just a misunderstanding. You and your spouse agree to the grounding, the central issue. You thought your spouse was reneging on the agreement when, in truth, you just hadn't actually resolved the date the grounding would start. You had to step back and listen to what you were both saying to realize that you weren't really disagreeing, but violently agreeing. Most arguments consist of battles over the 5 to 10 percent of the facts and stories that people disagree over. And while it's true that people eventually need to work through differences, you shouldn't start there. Start with an area of agreement. So here's the takeaway. If you completely agree with the other person's path, say so and move on. Agree when you agree. Don't turn an agreement into an argument. Build. Of course, the reason most of us turn agreements into debates is because we disagree with a certain portion of what the other person has said. Never mind that it's a minor portion. If it's a point of disagreement, we'll jump all over it like a fleeing criminal. Actually, we're trained to look for minor errors from an early age. For instance, we learn in kindergarten that if you have the right answer, you're the teacher's pet. Being right is good. Of course, if others have the right answer, they get to be the pet. So being right first is even better. You learn to look for even the tiniest of errors in others' facts, thinking, or logic. Then you point out the errors. Being right at the expense of others is best. By the time you finish your education, you have a virtual Ph.D. in catching trivial differences and turning them into a major deal. So when another person offers up a suggestion based on facts and stories, you're looking to disagree. And when you do find a minor difference, you turn this snack into a meal. Instead of remaining in healthy dialogue, you end up in violent agreement. On the other hand, when you watch people who are skilled in dialogue, it becomes clear that they're not playing this everyday game of trivial pursuit, looking for trivial differences and then proclaiming them aloud. In fact, they're looking for points of agreement. As a result, they'll often start with the words, I agree. Then they talk about the part they agree with. At least, that's where they start. Now, when the other person has merely left out an element of the argument, skilled people will agree and then build. Rather than saying, wrong, you forgot to mention, they say, absolutely. In addition, I noticed that. If you agree with what has been said, but the information is incomplete, build. Point out areas of agreement and then add elements that were left out of the discussion. Compare. Finally, if you do disagree, compare your path with the other person's. That is, rather than suggesting that he or she is wrong, suggest that you differ. He or she may, in fact, be wrong, but you don't know for sure until you hear both sides of the story. For now, you just know that the two of you differ. So instead of pronouncing wrong, start with a tentative but candid opening, such as, I think I see things differently. Let me describe how. Then, share your path using the state skills from Chapter 7. That is, begin by sharing your observations. Share them tentatively and invite others to test your ideas. After you've shared your path, invite the other person to help you compare it with his or her experience. Work together 
to explore and explain the differences. In summary, to help remember these skills, think of your ABCs, agree when you agree, build when others leave out key pieces, compare when you differ, don't turn differences into debates that lead to unhealthy relationships and bad results. My Crucial Conversation, Daryl K. A few weeks ago, a friend I highly respect told me about Crucial Conversations. The notion of Crucial Conversations resonated with me because I'm in the midst of some challenging leadership issues, all of which involve potentially difficult conversations leading to important decisions. Anyway, the idea intrigued me enough that I went straight to the bookstore and bought it. Once I began reading it, I couldn't put it down. I read it like a novel over an evening and the next morning, as every page seemed to offer help for the sticky situation I found myself in. You see, simultaneous to discovering the book, I have been in the end stages of a major negotiation with a key partner to jointly spin out a venture capital-funded company in Europe to further develop our technology. As we got closer to a deal over the last two months, the discussions started to decay, including heated phone calls and distrust on both sides. I was at a loss with how to effectively talk with them. Two weeks ago, we received a deal term sheet, so we had to either come together on an agreement or go our separate ways. If we went our separate ways, both sides knew it would end badly. So in desperation, last week, I met with my negotiating counterparts at JFK Airport to try to work through the impasses and strike a deal. In preparing for the JFK meeting, I reread the book, and it was like a light turning on for me. I went into the JFK negotiations armed with a new communication approach. I literally scripted my arguments and had crib sheets on the dialogue process. I followed the basic process from the book, and it worked like a charm. There were many points where the dialogue started to decay, but each time I was able to restore it and move the discussion forward. One of the big things I had to do was fight my impulse to argue for my view and instead restore safety by simply exploring the other side's perspective. After a six-hour meeting, we emerged with the outline of a very good deal for both parties. The deal was finalized over the last two days. Negotiating the details of the final documents under tight time pressures, over the phone, and on two different continents was challenging and full of landmines. In fact, just yesterday, at the moment of extreme tension, it seemed that the entire deal was coming unwound. I had to work the phones for four hours to rebuild dialogue between the parties so that we could get through the final pieces of the contract. Last night, we were down to one word in the 17-page agreement. I wouldn't give in, and they tried to bully me. I had to step back again, explore their views, and rebuild safety by finding a mutual purpose. We resolved the final piece very easily on a phone call at 5 a.m., in which I used the communication process to find common understanding between the parties. I truly don't think we would have struck the deal if a good friend had not recommended this powerful approach to communication. Daryl K. Summary. Explore others' paths. To encourage the free flow of meaning and help others leave silence or violence behind, explore their paths to action. Start with an attitude of curiosity and patience. This helps restore safety. Then use four powerful listening skills to retrace the other person's path to action to its origins. First, ask. Start by simply expressing interest in the other person's views. Second, mirror. Increase safety by respectfully acknowledging the emotions people appear to be feeling. Third, paraphrase. As others begin to share part of their story, restate what you've heard to show not just that you understand, but also that it's safe for them to share what they're thinking. Fourth, prime. If others continue to hold back, prime. Take your best guess at what they may be thinking or feeling. As you begin to share your views, remember, first, agree. Agree when you share views. Second, build. If others leave something out, agree where you share views, then build. And third, compare. When you do differ significantly, don't suggest others are wrong. Compare your two views. Chapter 9. Move to Action. How to Turn Crucial Conversations into Action and Results. To do nothing is in every man's power. Samuel Johnson.
Up until this point, we've suggested that getting more meaning into the pool helps with dialogue. It's the one thing that helps people make savvy decisions that, in turn, lead to smart, unified, and committed actions. In order to encourage this free flow of meaning, we've shared the skills we've been able to learn by watching people who are gifted at dialogue. By now, if you followed some or all of this advice, you're walking around with full pools. People who walk near you should hear the sloshing. It's time we add two final skills. Having more meaning in the pool, even jointly owning it, doesn't guarantee that we all agree on what we're going to do with the meaning. For example, when teams or families meet and generate a host of ideas, they often fail to convert the ideas into action for two reasons. First, they have unclear expectations about how decisions will be made, and second, they do a poor job of acting on the decisions they do make. This can be dangerous. In fact, when people move from adding meaning to the pool to moving to action, it's a prime time for new challenges to arise. Who is supposed to take the assignment? That can be controversial. How are we supposed to decide in the first place? That can be emotional. Let's take a look at what it takes to solve each of these problems. First, making decisions. Dialogue is not decision making. The two riskiest times in crucial conversations tend to be at the beginning and at the end. The beginning is risky because you have to find a way to create safety or else things go awry. The end is dicey because if you aren't careful about how you clarify the conclusion and decisions flowing from your pool of shared meaning, you can run into violated expectations later on. This can happen in two ways. How are decisions going to be made? First, people may not understand how decisions are going to be made. For example, Kara is miffed. Rene just plunked down a brochure for a three-day cruise and announced he had made reservations and even paid the $500 deposit for an outside suite. A week ago, they had a crucial conversation about vacation plans. Both expressed their views and preferences respectfully and candidly. It wasn't easy, but at the end they concluded a cruise suited both quite well. And yet, Kara is miffed, and Rene is stunned that Kara is anything less than ecstatic. Kara agreed in principle about a cruise. She didn't agree with this particular cruise. Rene thought that any cruise would be fine and made a decision on his own. Have fun on the cruise, Rene. Are we ever going to decide? The second problem with decision-making occurs when no decision gets made. Either ideas slip away and dissipate, or people can't figure out what to do with them. Or maybe everyone is waiting for everyone else to make the decisions. Hey, we filled the pool. Now you do something with it. In any case, decisions drag on forever. Decide how to decide. Both of these problems are solved if, before making a decision, the people involved decide how to decide. Don't allow people to assume that dialogue is decision-making. Dialogue is a process for getting all relevant meaning into a shared pool. That process, of course, involves everyone. However, Simply because everyone is allowed to share their meaning, actually encouraged to share their meaning, doesn't mean they are then guaranteed to take part in making all the decisions. To avoid violated expectations, separate dialogue from decision-making. Make it clear how decisions will be made, who will be involved, and why. When the line of authority is clear. When you're in a position of authority, you decide which method of decision-making you'll use. Managers and parents, for example, decide how to decide. It's part of their responsibility as leaders. For instance, VPs don't ask hourly employees to decide on pricing changes or product lines. That's the leader's job. Parents don't ask small children to pick their home security device or to set their own curfew. That's the job of the parent. Of course, both leaders and parents turn more decisions over to their direct reports and children when they warrant the responsibility but it's still the authority figure who decides what method of decision-making to employ. Deciding what decisions to turn over and when to do it is part of their stewardship. When the line of authority isn't clear. When there is no clear line of authority, deciding how to decide can be quite difficult. For instance, consider a conversation we referred to earlier, the one you had with your daughter's school teacher. Should you hold your child back? Whose choice is this anyway? Who decides whose choice it is? Does everyone have a say, then a vote? 
Is it the school officials' responsibility so they choose? Since parents have ultimate responsibility, should they consult with the appropriate experts and then decide? Is there even a clear answer to this tough question? A case like this is hand-tooled for dialogue. All of the participants need to get their meaning into the pool, including their opinions about who should make the final choice. That's part of the meaning you need to discuss. If you don't openly talk about who decides and why, and your opinions vary widely, you're likely to end up in a heated battle that can only be resolved in court. Handled poorly, that's exactly where these kinds of issues are resolved. The Jones Family versus Happy Valley School District. So what's a person to do? Talk openly about your child's abilities and interests, as well as about how the final choice will be made. Don't mention lawyers or a lawsuit in your opening comments. This only reduces safety and sets up an adversarial climate. Your goal is to have an open, honest, and healthy discussion about a child, not to exert your influence, make threats, or somehow beat the educators. Stick with the opinions of the experts at hand and discuss how and why they should be involved. When decision-making authority is unclear, use your best dialogue skills to get meaning into the pool. Jointly decide how to decide. The Four Methods of Decision-Making When you're deciding how to decide, it helps to have a way of talking about the decision-making options available. There are four common ways of making decisions. Command, consult, vote, and consensus. These four options represent increasing degrees of involvement. Increased involvement, of course, brings the benefit of increased commitment, along with the curse of decreased decision-making efficiency. Savvy people choose from among these four methods of decision-making the one that best suits their particular circumstances. Command. Let's start with decisions that are made with no involvement whatsoever. This happens in one of two ways. Either outside forces place demands on us, demands that leave us no wiggle room, or we turn decisions over to others and then follow their lead. We don't care enough to be involved. Let someone else do the work. In the case of external forces, customers set prices, agencies mandate safety standards, and other governing bodies simply hand us demands. As much as employees like to think their bosses are sitting around making choices, for the most part they're simply passing on the demands of the circumstances. These are command decisions. With command decisions, it's not our job to decide what to do. It's our job to decide how to make it work. In the case of turning decisions over to others, we decide either that this is such a low-stakes issue that we don't care enough to take part, or that we completely trust the ability of the delegate to make the right decision. More involvement adds nothing. In strong teams and great relationships, many decisions are made by turning the final choice over to someone we trust to make a good decision. We don't want to take the time ourselves and gladly turn the decision over to others. Consult. Consulting is a process whereby decision makers invite others to influence them before they make their choice. You can consult with experts, a representative population, or even everyone who wants to offer an opinion. Consulting can be an efficient way of gaining ideas and support without bogging down the decision making process, at least not too much. Wise leaders, parents, and even couples frequently make decisions in this way. They gather ideas, evaluate options, make a choice, and then inform the broader population. Vote. Voting is best suited to situations where efficiency is the highest value, and you're selecting from a number of good options. Members of the team realize they may not get their first choice, but frankly, they don't want to waste time talking the issue to death. They may discuss options for a while and then call for a vote. When facing several decent options, voting is a great time saver, but should never be used when team members don't agree to support whatever decision is made. In these cases, consensus is required. Consensus. This method can be both a great blessing and a frustrating curse. Consensus means you talk until everyone honestly agrees to one decision. This method can produce tremendous unity and high-quality decisions. If misapplied, it can also be a horrible waste of time. It should only be used with, one, high stakes and complex issues, or two, issues where everyone absolutely must support the final choice. How to choose. Now that we know the four methods, let's explore which method to use at which time, along with some hints about how to avoid common blunders. Four important questions. 
When choosing among the four methods of decision-making, consider the following questions. First, who cares? Determine who genuinely wants to be involved in the decision along with those who will be affected. These are your candidates for involvement. Don't involve people who don't care. Second, who knows? Identify who has the expertise you need to make the best decision. Encourage these people to take part. Try not to involve people who contribute no new information. Third, who must agree? Think of those whose cooperation you might need in the form of authority or influence in any decisions you might make. It's better to involve these people than to surprise them and then suffer their open resistance. Fourth, how many people is it worth involving? Your goal should be to involve the fewest number of people while still considering the quality of the decision along with the support that people will give it. Ask, do we have enough people to make a good choice? Will others have to be involved to gain their commitment? How about you? Here's a suggestion for a great exercise for teams or couples, particularly those that are frustrated about decision-making. Make a list of some of the important decisions made in the team or relationship. Then discuss how each decision is currently made and how each should be made, using the four important questions. After discussing each decision, decide how you will make decisions in the future. A crucial conversation about your decision-making practices can resolve many frustrating issues. Make assignments. Put decisions into action. Now let's take a look at the final step. You've engaged in healthy dialogue, filled the pool of meaning, decided how you're going to draw from the pool, and eventually come to some decisions. It's time to do something. Some of the items may have been completely resolved during the discussion, but many may require a person or team to do something. You'll have to make assignments. As you might suspect, when you're involved with two or more people, there's a chance that there will be some confusion. To avoid common traps, make sure you consider the following four elements. Who, does what, by when, how will you follow up? Who. To quote an English proverb, Everybody's business is nobody's business. If you don't make an actual assignment to an actual person, there's a good chance that nothing will ever come of all the work you've gone through to make a decision. When it's time to pass out assignments, remember, there is no we. We, when it comes to assignments, actually means not me. It's code. Even when individuals are not trying to duck an assignment, the term we can lead them to believe that others are taking on the responsibility. Assign a name to every responsibility. This especially applies at home. If you're divvying up household chores, be sure you've got a specific person to go with each chore. That is, if you assign two or three people to take on a task, appoint one of them the responsible party. Otherwise, any sense of responsibility will be lost in a flurry of finger-pointing later on. Does what? Be sure to spell out the exact deliverables you have in mind. The fuzzier the expectations, the higher the likelihood of disappointment. For example, the eccentric entrepreneur Howard Hughes once assigned a team of engineers to design and build the world's first steam-powered car. When sharing his dream of a vehicle that could run on heated water, he gave them virtually no direction. After several years of intense labor, the engineers successfully produced the first prototype by running dozens of pipes through the car's body, thus solving the problem of where to put all the water required to run a steam-powered car. The vehicle was essentially a giant radiator. When Hughes asked the engineers what would happen if the car got into a wreck, they nervously explained that the passengers would be boiled alive, much like lobsters in a pot. Hughes was so upset in what the crew came up with that he insisted that they cut it up into pieces no larger than three inches. That was the end of the project. Learn from Hughes. When you're first agreeing on an assignment, clarify up front the exact details of what you want. Couples get into trouble in this area when one of the parties doesn't want to take the time to think carefully about the deliverables and then later on becomes upset because his or her unstated desires weren't met. Have you ever remodeled a room with a loved one? Then you know what we're talking about. Better to spend the time up front clarifying exactly what you want rather than waste resources and hurt feelings on the back end. To help clarify deliverables, use contrasting. If you've seen people misunderstand an assignment in the past, explain the common mistake as an example of what you don't want. If possible, point to physical examples. 
Rather than talk in abstract, bring a prototype or sample. We learned this particular trick when hiring a set designer. The renowned designer talked about what he would deliver, and it sounded great to us. $25,000 later, he delivered something that would never work. We had to start over from scratch. From that day on, we've learned to point to pictures and talk about what we want and don't want. The clearer the picture of the deliverable, the less likely you'll be unpleasantly surprised. By when? It's shocking how often people leave this element out of an assignment. Instead of giving a deadline, people simply point to the setting sun of someday. With vague or unspoken deadlines, other urgencies come up, and the assignment finds its way to the bottom of the pile, where it is soon forgotten. Assignments without deadlines are far better at producing guilt than stimulating action. Goals without deadlines aren't goals. They're merely directions. How will you follow up? Always agree on how often and by what method you'll follow up on the assignment. It could be a simple email confirming the completion of a project. It might be a full report in a team or family meeting. More often than not, it comes down to progress checks along the way. It's actually fairly easy to build follow-up methods into the assignment. For example, call me on my cell phone when you finish your homework. Then you can go play with friends, okay? Or perhaps you'll prefer to rely on milestones. Let me know when you've completed your library research. Then we'll sit down and look at the next steps. Milestones, of course, must be linked to a drop-dead date. Let me know as soon as you've completed the research component of this project. You've got until the last week in November but if you finish earlier, give me a call. Remember, if you want people to feel accountable, you must give them an opportunity to account. Build an expectation for follow-up into every assignment. Document your work. Once again, a proverb comes to mind. One dull pencil is worth six sharp minds. Don't leave your hard work to memory. If you've gone to the effort to complete a crucial conversation, don't fritter away all the meaning you created by trusting your memories. Write down the details of conclusions, decisions, and assignments. Remember to record who does what by when. Revisit your notes at key times, usually the next meeting, and review assignments. As you review what was supposed to be completed, hold people accountable. When someone fails to deliver on a promise, it's time for dialogue. Discuss the issue by using the state skills we covered in Chapter 7. By holding people accountable, not only do you increase their motivation and ability to deliver on promises, but you create a culture of integrity. Summary. Move to action. Turn your successful, crucial conversations into great decisions and united action by avoiding the two traps of violated expectations and inaction. First, decide how to decide. Will your decision be made by command? Decisions are made without involving others. Consult. Input is gathered from the group and then a subset decides. Vote. An agreed-upon percentage swings the decision. Or consensus. Everyone comes to an agreement and then supports the final decision. Finish clearly. Determine who does what by when. Make the deliverables crystal clear. Set a follow-up time. Record the commitments and then follow up. Finally, hold people accountable to their promises. Chapter 10. Yeah, but. Advice for tough cases. Good words are worth much and cost little. George Herbert. As we, the authors, have taught this material, we've grown accustomed to people saying, yeah, but my situation's more difficult than that, or yeah, but the people I deal with aren't so quick to come around. Besides, most of the problems I face come as a surprise. I'm caught off guard. In short, People can think of a dozen reasons why the skills we've been talking about don't apply to the situations they care about. Yeah, but what if someone does something that's really subtle? It drives you crazy, but it's hard to identify. How do you handle that? Yeah, but what if my life partner refuses to ever talk about anything important? You can't force a person into dialogue. Yeah, but what if I can't calm down quickly enough? I've been told not to go to bed angry, but sometimes I think I need time alone. What should I do? Yeah, but what if I don't trust the other person? How am I supposed to deal with that? Or, yeah, but both my boss and spouse are too sensitive to take any feedback. Shouldn't I just let things slide? 
In truth, the dialogue skills we've shared apply to just about any problem you can imagine. However, since some are more difficult than others, we've chosen 17 tough cases. We'll take a moment to share a thought or two on each. Sexual or other harassment Yeah, but it's not like anyone's blatantly harassing me or anything, but I don't like the way I'm being treated. How can I bring it up without making enemies? The danger point Someone is making comments or gestures that you find offensive. The person does it seldom enough, and he or she's subtle enough that you're not sure if HR or your boss can even help. What can you do? In these situations, it's easy to think that the offender has all the power. It seems as if the rules of polite society make it so that others can behave inappropriately, and you end up looking like you're overreacting if you bring it up. Generally speaking, a vast majority of these problems go away if they're privately, respectfully, and firmly discussed. Your biggest challenge will be the respect part. If you put up with this behavior for too long, you'll be inclined to tell a more and more potent villain story about the offender. This will jack up your emotions to the point that you'll go in with guns blazing, even if only through your body language. The Solution Tell the rest of the story. If you've tolerated the behavior for a long time before holding the conversation, own up to it. This may help you treat the individual like a reasonable, rational, and decent person, even if some of his or her behavior doesn't fit this description. When you feel a measure of respect for the other person, you're ready to begin. After establishing a mutual purpose for the exchange, state your path. For example, I'd like to talk about something that's getting in the way of my working with you. It's a tough issue to bring up but I think it'll help us be better teammates if I do. Is that okay? Here you're establishing a mutual purpose. When I walk into your office, sometimes your eyes move up and down my body. And when I sit next to you at a computer, sometimes you put your arm around the back of my chair. I don't know that you're aware you're doing these things, so I thought I'd bring them up because they send a message that makes me uncomfortable. How do you see it? Notice that here you're stating your path. If you can be respectful and private but firm in this conversation, most problem behavior will stop. And remember, if the behavior is over the line, you shouldn't hesitate to contact HR to ensure your rights and dignity are protected. My overly sensitive spouse. Yeah, but what do you do when your spouse is too sensitive? You try to give him or her some constructive feedback, but he or she reacts so strongly that you end up going to silence. The danger point. Often couples come to an unspoken agreement during the first year or so of their marriage that affects how they communicate for the rest of their marriage. Say one person is touchy and can't take feedback, or the other doesn't give it very well. In any case, they in effect agree to say nothing to each other. They live in silence. Problems have to be huge before they're discussed. The solution. This is generally a problem of not knowing how to state your path. When something bothers you, catch it early. Contrasting can also help. I'm not trying to blow this out of proportion. I just want to deal with it before it gets out of hand. Describe the specific behaviors you've observed. When Jimmy leaves his room a mess, you use sarcasm to get his attention. You call him a pig and then laugh as if you didn't mean it. Tentatively explain the consequences. I don't think it's having the effect you want. He doesn't pick up on the hint, and I'm afraid that he's starting to resent you. Your story. Encourage testing. Do you see it differently? Finally, learn to look for signs that safety is at risk and make it safe. When you state things well and others become defensive, refuse to conclude that the issue is impossible to discuss. Think harder about your approach. Step out of the content do what it takes to make sure your partner feels safe, and then try again to candidly state your view. When spouses stop giving each other helpful feedback, they lose out on the help of a lifelong confidant and coach. They miss out on hundreds of opportunities to help each other communicate more effectively. Failure to live up to agreements. Yeah, but my teammates are hypocrites. We get together and talk about all the ways we could improve, but then people don't do what they agreed to. The danger point. The worst teams walk away from problems like these. In good teams, the boss eventually deals with problem behavior. In the best teams, 
Every team member is part of the system of accountability. If team members see others violate a team agreement, they speak up immediately and directly. It's dangerous to wait for or expect the boss to do what good teammates should do themselves. The Solution If your teammate isn't doing what you think he or she should, it's up to you to speak up. We realized this after watching a group of executives that agreed they'd hold off on all discretionary spending to help free up cash for a short-term crunch. This strategy sounded good in the warm glow of an off-site meeting, but the very next day a team member rushed back and prepaid a vendor for six months of consulting work, work that appeared to be discretionary. A team member who saw the executive prepare for and then make the prepayment didn't realize this was the crucial conversation that would determine whether the team would pull together or fall apart on this issue. Instead, he decided it was up to the boss to hold this person accountable. He said nothing. By the time the boss found out about the transaction and addressed the issue, the policy had already been violated and the money spent. Motivation to support the new plan dissipated and the team ran short of cash. When teams try to rally around aggressive change or bold new initiatives, they need to be prepared to address the problem when a team member doesn't live up to the agreement. Success does not depend on perfect compliance with new expectations, but on teammates who hold crucial conversations with one another when others appear to be reverting to old patterns. Deference to authority Yeah, but the people who work for me filter what they say by guessing what they think I'm willing to hear. They take little initiative in solving important problems because they're afraid I'll disagree with them. The danger point. When leaders face deference, or what feels like kissing up, they typically make one of two mistakes. Either they misdiagnose the cause, fear, or they try to banish deference with a brash command. Misdiagnose. Often leaders are causing the fear but denying it. Who, me? I don't do a thing to make people feel uncomfortable. They haven't learned to look. They're unaware of their style under stress. Despite this disclaimer, the way they carry themselves, their habit of speaking in absolutes, their subtle use of authority, something out there is creating fear and eventual deference. Then there's the other misdiagnosis. Leaders who face head-bobbing kiss-ups often think they're doing something wrong when, in fact, they're living with ghosts of previous leaders. They do their best to be open and supportive and to involve people, but despite their genuine efforts, people still keep their distance. Often people treat their leaders like celebrities or dictators, regardless of the fact that they've done nothing to deserve it. Before you do anything, you need to find out if you're the cause, if you're living with ghosts of bosses past, or both. Command it away. Many leaders seek the simple path. They tell people to stop deferring. It seems to me that you're agreeing with me because I'm the boss and not because what I'm saying makes sense. Absolutely. Well, I'd prefer that you stop deferring to me and simply listen to the idea. Okay, whatever you say, boss. With ingrained deference, you face a catch-22. If you don't say something, it'll probably continue. If you do say something, you may be inadvertently encouraging it to continue. The Solution Work on me first. Discover your part in the problem. Don't ask your direct reports. If they're already deferring to you, they'll whitewash the problem. Consult with a peer who watches you in action. Ask for honest feedback. Are you doing things that cause people to defer to you? If so, what? Explore your peer's path by having him or her point out your specific behaviors. Jointly develop a plan of attack, work on it, and seek continued feedback. If the problem stems from ghosts, the actions of previous leaders, go public. Describe the problem in a group or team meeting, and then ask for advice. Don't try to command it away. You can't. Reward risk-takers. Encourage testing. When people do express an opinion contrary to yours, thank them for their honesty. Play devil's advocate. If you can't get others to disagree, then disagree with yourself. Let people know that all ideas are open to question. If you need to, leave the room. Give people some breathing space. Failed Trust yeah, but I don't know what to do. I'm not sure I can trust this person. He missed an important deadline. Now I wonder if I should trust him again. The danger point. People often assume that trust is something you have or don't have. Either you trust someone or you don't. That puts too much pressure on trust. What do you mean I can't stay out past midnight? Don't you trust me? Your teenage son inquires. 
Trust doesn't have to be universally offered. In truth, it's usually offered in degrees, and it's very topic-specific. It also comes in two flavors, motive and ability. For example, you can trust me to administer CPR if needed. I'm motivated, but you can't trust me to do a good job. I know nothing about it. The Solution Deal with trust around the issue, not around the person. When it comes to regaining trust in others, don't set the bar too high. Just try to trust them in the moment, not across all issues. You don't have to trust them in everything. To make it safe for yourself in the moment, bring up your concerns. Tentatively state what you see happening. I get the sense that you're only sharing the good side of your plan. I need to hear the possible risks before I'm comfortable. Is that okay? If they play games, call them on it. Also, don't use your mistrust as a club to punish people. If they've earned your mistrust in one area, don't let it bleed over into your overall perception of their character. If you tell yourself a villain story that exaggerates others' untrustworthiness, you'll act in ways that help them justify themselves in being even less worthy of your trust. You'll start up a self-defeating cycle and get more of what you don't want. Won't talk about anything serious. Yeah, but my spouse is the person you talked about earlier. You know, I try to hold a meaningful discussion, I try to work through an important problem, and he or she simply withdraws. What can I do? The Danger Point It's common to blame others for not wanting to stay in dialogue as if it were some kind of genetic disorder. That's not the problem. If others don't want to talk about tough issues, it's because they believe that it won't do any good. Either they aren't good at dialogue, or you aren't, or you both aren't, or so they think. The Solution Work on me first. Your spouse may have an aversion to all crucial conversations, even when talking to a skilled person. Nevertheless, you're still the only person you can work on. Start with simple challenges. Don't go for the really tough issues. Do your best to make it safe. Constantly watch to see when your spouse starts to become uncomfortable. Use tentative language. Separate intent from outcome. I'm pretty sure you're not intending to... If your spouse consistently seems unwilling to talk about his or her personal issues, learn how to explore others' paths. Practice these skills every chance you get. In short, start simply and then bring all your dialogue tools into play. Now, having said all of this, exercise patience. Don't nag. Don't lose hope and then go to violence. Every time you become aggressive or insulting, you give your spouse additional evidence that crucial conversations do nothing but cause harm. If you're constantly on your best dialogue behavior, you'll build more safety in the relationship, and your spouse will be more likely to begin picking up on the cues and start coming around. When you see signs of improvement, you can accelerate the growth by inviting your spouse to talk with you about how you talk. Your challenge here is to build safety by establishing a compelling mutual purpose. You need to help your partner see a reason for having this conversation, a reason that is so compelling that he or she will be willing to take part. Share what you think the consequences of having or not having this conversation could be, both positive and negative. Explain what it means to both you and the relationship. Then invite your spouse to help identify the topics you have a hard time discussing. Take turns describing how you both tend to approach these topics. Then discuss the possible benefits of helping each other make improvements. Sometimes if you can't talk about the tough topics, you can more easily talk about how you talk or don't talk about them. That helps get things started. Vague but annoying. Yeah, but the person I'm thinking of doesn't do blatantly unacceptable things, nothing to write home about, just subtle stuff that's starting to drive me crazy. The danger point. If people simply bother you at some abstract level, maybe what they're doing isn't worthy of a conversation. Perhaps the problem is not their behavior, but your tolerance. For example, an executive laments, My employees really disappoint me. Just look at the length of their hair. It turns out that the employees in question have no contact with anyone besides one another. Their hair length has nothing to do with job performance. The boss really has no reason to say anything. However, when actions are both subtle and unacceptable, then you have to retrace your path to action and put your finger on exactly what others are doing, or you have nothing to discuss. Abstract descriptions peppered with your vague conclusions or stories have no place in crucial conversations. For example, whenever your family gets together, your brother constantly takes pot shots at everyone else using sarcastic humor. 
The individual comments aren't directly insulting enough to discuss. What you want to talk about is the fact that these constant comments make every get-together feel negative. Remember, clarifying the facts is the homework required for crucial conversations. The solution. Retrace your path to action to its source. Identify specific behaviors that are out of bounds and take note. When you've done your homework, consider the behaviors you noted and make sure the story you're telling yourself about these behaviors is important enough for dialogue. If it is, then make it safe and state your path. Shows no initiative. Yeah, but some members of my work team do what they're asked, but no more. If they run into a problem, they take one simple stab at fixing it, but if their efforts don't pay off, they quit. The danger point. Most people are far more likely to talk about the presence of a bad behavior than the absence of a good one. When someone really messes up, leaders and parents alike are compelled to take action. However, when people simply fail to be excellent, it's hard to know what to say. The solution. Establish new and higher expectations. Don't deal with a specific instance. Deal with the overall pattern. If you want someone to show more initiative, tell him or her. Give specific examples of when the person ran into a barrier and then backed off after a single try. Raise the bar and then make it crystal clear what you've done. Jointly brainstorm what the person could have done to be both more persistent and more creative in coming up with the solution. For instance, I asked you to finish up a task that absolutely had to be completed before I returned from a trip. You ran into a problem, tried to get in touch with me, and then simply left a message with my four-year-old. What could you have done to track me down on the road? Or what would it have taken to create a backup strategy? Pay attention to ways you are compensating for someone's lack of initiative. Have you made yourself responsible for following up? If so, talk with that person about assuming this responsibility. Have you asked more than one person to take the same assignment so you can be sure it will get done? If so, talk to the person originally assigned about reporting progress to you early so you only need to put someone else on the job when there's a clear need for more resources. Stop acting out your expectations that others won't take initiative. Instead, talk your expectations out and come to agreements that place the responsibility on the team members while giving you information early enough that you aren't left high and dry. Shows a pattern. Yeah, but it isn't a single problem. It's that I keep having to talk with people about the same problem. I feel like I have to choose between being a nag and putting up with the problem. Now what? The danger point. Some crucial conversations go poorly because you're having the wrong conversations. You talk to someone who is late for a meeting for the second time, then the third. Your blood begins to boil. Then you bite your lip and give another gentle reminder. Finally, after your resentment builds up because you're telling yourself an ugly story, you become violent. You make a sarcastic or cutting comment and then end up looking stupid because the reaction seems way out of line given the minor offense. If you continue to return to the original problem, coming in late, Without talking about the new problem, failing to live up to commitments, you're stuck in Groundhog Day. We talk about this problem using the Groundhog Day movie metaphor. If you return to the same initial problem, you're like Bill Murray in the movie. You're forced to relive the same situation over and over rather than deal with the bigger problem. Nothing ever gets resolved. The Solution Learn to look for patterns. Don't focus exclusively on a single event. Watch for behavior over time, then state your path by talking about the pattern. For example, if a person is late for meetings and agrees to do better, the next conversation should not be about tardiness. It should be about his or her failure to keep a commitment. This is a bigger issue. It's now about trust and respect. People often become far more emotional than the issue they're discussing warrants because they're talking about the wrong issue. If you're really bothered because of a pattern, but you're talking about this latest instance, your emotions will seem out of proportion. In contrast, an interesting thing happens when you hold the right conversation. Your emotions calm down. When you talk about what's really eating you, the pattern, you'll be able to be more composed and effective. Don't get pulled into any one instance or your concern will seem trivial. Talk about the overall pattern. I need time to calm down. Yeah, but I've been told that I should never go to bed angry. Is that always a good idea? The danger point. 
Once you become angry, it's not always easy to calm down. You've told yourself an ugly story, your body has responded by preparing for a fight, and now you're trying your best not to duke it out. Only your body hasn't caught up with your brain. So what do you do? Do you try to stay in dialogue even though your intuition tells you to back off and buy some time? After all, Mom said, never go to bed angry. The Solution Okay, so your mom wasn't exactly right. She was right by suggesting that you shouldn't let serious problems go unresolved. She was wrong about always sticking with a discussion, no matter your emotional state. It's perfectly okay to suggest that you need some time alone and that you'd like to pick up the discussion later on, say, tomorrow. Then, after you've dissipated the adrenaline and have had time to think about the issues, hold the conversation. Coming to mutual agreement to take a time out is not the same thing as going to silence. In fact, it's a very healthy example of dialogue. As a side note on this topic, it's not such a good idea to tell others that they need to calm down or that they need to take some time out. They may need the time, but it's hard to suggest it without coming off as patronizing. Take ten minutes, calm down, and then get back to me. With others, get back to the source of their anger, Retrace their path to action. Endless excuses. Yeah, but my teenage son is a master of excuses. I talk to him about a problem, and he's always got a new reason why it's not his fault. The danger point. It's easy to be lulled into a series of never-ending excuses, particularly if the other person doesn't want to do what you've asked and learns that as long as he or she can give you a plausible reason, all bets are off. I go to work before my son leaves for school, and he's constantly late. First he told me that he was late because his alarm broke. The next day, the old car we bought him had a problem, or so he says. Then his friend forgot to pick him up. Then he had a head cold and couldn't hear his new alarm. Then, the solution. With imaginative people, take a preemptive strike against all new excuses. Gain a commitment to solve the overall problem, not simply the stated cause. For instance, the first time the person is late, seek a commitment to fix the alarm and anything else that might stand in the way. Repairing the alarm only deals with one potential cause. Ask the person to deal with the problem, being late. So you think that if you get a new alarm, you'll be able to make it to school on time? That's fine with me. Do whatever it takes to get there on time. Can I count on you being there tomorrow at 8 o'clock sharp? Then remember... As the excuses accumulate, don't talk about the most recent excuse. Talk about the pattern. Insubordination, or over-the-line disrespect. Yeah, but what if the people you talk to not only are angry, but also become insubordinate? How do you handle that? The danger point. When you're discussing a tough issue with employees or even your kids, there's always the chance they'll step over the line. They'll move from a friendly dispute to a heated discussion and then into the nasty territory of being insubordinate or acting disrespectful. The trouble is, insubordination is so rare that it takes most leaders by surprise. So they buy time to figure out what to do. And in so doing, they let the person get away with something that was way out of line. Worse still, their perceived indifference makes them an accomplice to all future abuses. Parents, on the other hand, caught by surprise, tend to respond in kind, becoming angry and insulting. The solution. Show zero tolerance for insubordination. Speak up immediately, but respectfully. Change topics from the issue at hand to how the person is currently acting. Catch the escalating disrespect before it turns into abuse and insubordination. Let the person know that his or her passion for the issue at hand is leading down a dangerous trail. I'd like to step away from this scheduling issue for a moment and then we'll come right back to it. The way you're leaning in toward me and raising your voice seems disrespectful. I want to help address your concerns, but I'm going to have a tough time doing so if this continues. If you can't catch it early, discuss the insubordination and seek help from HR specialists. Regretting saying something horrible. Yeah, but... Sometimes if I let a problem go for a long time, and then when I bring it up, I say something just awful. How do I recover from this? The danger point. When other people do things that bother us, and then we tell ourselves a story about how they're bad and wrong, we're setting ourselves up for an unhealthy conversation. Of course, when we tell ourselves an ugly story and then sit on it, it only gets worse. 
Stories left unattended don't get better with time. They ferment. Then, when we eventually can't take it anymore, we say something we regret. The Solution First, don't repress your story. Use your state skills early on, before the story turns too ugly. Second, if you have let the problem build, don't hold the crucial conversation while angry. Set aside a time when you can discuss it in a calm fashion. Then, using your state skills, explain what you've seen and heard, and tentatively tell the most simple and least offensive story. The way you just told me that our neighbor thinks I'm a real idiot has me worried. You smiled and laughed when you said it. I'm beginning to wonder if you take pleasure in running to me with negative feedback. Is that what's going on? If you do say something horrible, you're cruel, you know that? You love to hurt me and I'm sick of it. Apologize. You can't unring the bell, but you can apologize. Then, state your path. Touchy and personal. Yeah, but what if someone has a hygiene problem? Or maybe someone's boring and people avoid him or her. How could you ever talk about something personal and sensitive like that? The danger point. Most people avoid sensitive issues like the plague. Who can blame them? Unfortunately, when fear and misapplied compassion rule over honesty and courage, people can go for years without being given information that could be extremely helpful. When people do speak up, they often leap from silence to violence. Jokes, nicknames, and other veiled attempts to sneak in vague feedback are both indirect and disrespectful. Also, the longer you go without saying anything, the greater the pain when you finally deliver the message. Solution Use contrasting Explain that you don't want to hurt the person's feelings, but you do want to share something that could be helpful. Establish mutual purpose. Let the other person know your intentions are honorable. Also explain that you're reluctant to bring up the issue because of its personal nature, but since the problem is interfering with the person's effectiveness, you really must. Tentatively describe the problem. Don't play it up or pile it on. Describe the specific behaviors and then move to solutions. Although these discussions are never easy, they certainly don't have to be offensive or insulting. Word games Yeah, but my children are constantly playing word games. If I try to tell them that they shouldn't have done something, they say I never told them exactly that. They're starting to get on my nerves. The Danger Point Sometimes parents and leaders are tricked into accepting poor performance by silver-tongued individuals who are infinitely creative in coming up with new ways to explain why they didn't know any better. Not only do these inventive people have the ability to conjure up creative excuses, but they also have the energy and will to do so incessantly. Eventually, they wear you down. As a result, they get away with doing less or doing it poorly while hardworking, energetic family members or employees end up carrying an unfair share of the load. The Solution This is another case of pattern over instance. Tentatively state the pattern of splitting hairs and playing word games. Let them know that they aren't fooling anyone. In this case, don't focus exclusively on actions because creative people can always find new inappropriate actions. You didn't say I couldn't call her stupid. Talk about both behaviors and outcomes. You're hurting your sister's feelings when you call her stupid. Please don't do that, or anything else that might hurt her feelings. Use previous behavior as an example, and then hold them accountable to results. Don't get pulled into discussing any one instance. Stick with the pattern. No warning. Yeah, but I've got a lot of good people working for me, but they're too full of surprises. When they run into problems, I only find out after it's too late. They always have a good excuse, so what should I do? The Danger Point Leaders who are constantly being surprised allow it to happen. The first time an employee says, Sorry, but I ran into a problem, the leaders miss the point. They listen to the problem, work on it, and then move on to a new topic. In so doing, they are saying, It's okay to surprise me. If you have a legitimate excuse, stop what you're doing, turn your efforts to something else, and then wait until I show up to spring the news. The Solution Make it perfectly clear that once you've given an assignment, there are only two acceptable paths. Employees need to complete the assignment as planned, or if they run into a problem, they need to immediately inform you. No surprises. Similarly, if they decide that another job needs to be done instead, they call you. No surprises. 
Clarify the no surprises rule. The first time someone comes back with a legitimate excuse, but he or she didn't tell you when the problem first came up, deal with this as the new problem. We agreed that you'd let me know immediately. I didn't get a call. What happened? Dealing with someone who breaks all the rules. Yeah, but what if the person you're dealing with violates all of the dialogue principles most of the time, especially during crucial conversations? The danger point. When you look at a continuum of dialogue skills, most of us, by definition, fall in the middle. Sometimes we're on and sometimes we're off. Some of us are good at avoiding fool's choices. Others are good at making it safe. Of course, you have the extremes as well. You have people who are veritable conversational geniuses. And now you're saying that you work with, maybe live with, someone who is the complete opposite. He or she rarely uses any skills. What's a person to do? The danger, of course, is that the other person isn't as bad as you think. You bring out the worst in him or her, or that he or she really is that bad, and you try to address all the problems at once. The Solution Let's assume this person is pretty bad all of the time and with most everyone. Where do you start? Let's apply a metaphor here. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Choose your targets very carefully. Consider two dimensions. One, what bothers you the most? He or she is constantly assuming the worst and telling horrible stories, for example. Two, what might be the easiest to work on? He or she rarely shows any appreciation, for instance. Look for those areas that are most grievous to you and might not be all that hard to talk about. Pick one element and work on it. Establish mutual purpose. Frame the conversation in a way that the other person will care about. I love it when we're feeling friendly toward each other. I'd like to have that feeling more frequently between us. There are a couple of things I'd like to talk about that I'm pretty convinced would help us with that. Can we talk? State the issue, and then work on that one issue. Don't nag. Don't take on everything at once. Deal with one element, one day at a time. Chapter 11. Putting it all together. Tools for preparing and learning. I can win an argument on any topic against any opponent. People know this and steer clear of me at parties. Often, as a sign of their great respect, they don't even invite me. Dave Barry If you read the previous pages in a short period of time, you probably feel like an anaconda that just swallowed a warthog. It's a lot to digest. You may well be wondering at this point how you can possibly keep all these ideas straight, especially during something as unpredictable and fast-moving as a crucial conversation. This chapter will help with the daunting task of making dialogue tools and skills memorable and usable. First, we'll simplify things by sharing what we've heard from people who have changed their lives by using these skills. Second, we'll walk you through an example of a crucial conversation where all the dialogue principles are applied. Two Levers over the years, people often tell us that the principles and skills contained in this book have helped them a great deal. But how? In what way can the printed word lead to important changes? After watching people at home and at work, as well as interviewing them, we've learned that some people make progress by picking one skill that they know will help them get to dialogue in a current, crucial conversation. But others focus less on skills and more on principles. For example, here are two high-leverage ways of getting started with increasing your capacity to get to dialogue by becoming more conscious of these two key principles. Learn to look. The first lever for positive change is learn to look. That is, people who improve their dialogue skills continually ask themselves whether they're in or out of dialogue. This alone makes a huge difference. Even people who can't remember or never learn the skills of state or amp, etc., are able to benefit from this material by simply asking if they're falling into silence or violence. They may not know exactly how to fix the specific problem they're facing, but they do know that if they're not in dialogue, it can't be good. And then they try something to get back to dialogue. As it turns out, trying something is better than doing nothing. So remember to ask the following important question. Are we playing games or are we in dialogue? It's a wonderful start. Many people get additional help in learning to look from their friends. They go through training as families or teams. As they share concepts and ideas, they learn a common vocabulary. 
This shared way of talking about crucial conversations helps people change. Perhaps the most common way that the language of dialogue finds itself into everyday conversation is with the expression, I think we've moved away from dialogue. This simple reminder helps people catch themselves early on, before the damage is severe. As we've watched executive teams, work groups, and couples simply go public with the fact that they're starting to move towards silence or violence, others often recognize the problem and take corrective action. You're right. I'm not telling you what needs to be said. Or, I'm sorry, I've been trying to force my ideas on you. Make it safe. The second lever is make it safe. We've suggested that dialogue consists of the free flow of meaning and that the number one flow stopper is a lack of safety. When you notice that you and others have moved away from dialogue, do something to make it safer. Anything. We've suggested a few skills, but those are merely a handful of common practices. They're not immutable principles. To no one's surprise, there are many things you can do to increase safety. If you simply realize that your challenge is to make it safer, nine out of ten times you'll intuitively do something that helps. Sometimes you'll build safety by asking a question and showing interest in others' views. Sometimes an appropriate touch with loved ones and family members, not at work where touching can equate with harassment, can communicate safety. Apologies, smiles, even a request for a brief time out can help restore safety when things get dicey. The main idea is to make it safe. Do something to make others comfortable. And remember, virtually every skill we've covered in this book, from contrasting to priming, offers a tool for building safety. These two levers form the basis for recognizing, building, and maintaining dialogue. When the concept of dialogue is introduced, these are the ideas most people can readily take in and apply to crucial conversations. Now, Let's move on to a discussion of the rest of the principles we've covered. How to prepare for a crucial conversation. Here's one last tool to help you turn these ideas into action. It's a powerful way of coaching yourself or another person through a crucial conversation. It can literally help you identify the precise place you are getting stuck and the specific skill that can help you get unstuck. Let's see how it all works. Finally, We've included an extended case here to show how these principles might look when you find yourself in the middle of a crucial conversation. It outlines a tough discussion between you and your sister about dividing your mother's estate. The case is set up to illustrate where the principles apply and to briefly review each principle as it comes up in the conversation. The conversation begins with you bringing up the family summer house. Your mother's funeral was a month ago, and now it's time to split up both money and keepsakes. You're not really looking forward to it. The issue is made touchier by the fact that you feel that since you almost single-handedly cared for your mother during the last several years, you should be compensated. You don't think your sister will see things the same way. Your Crucial Conversation You We have to sell the summer cottage. We never use it, and we need the cash to pay for my expenses from taking care of Mom the past four years. Sister Please, don't start with the guilt. I sent you money every month to help take care of Mom. If I didn't have to travel for my jobs, you know I would have wanted her at my house. You notice that emotions are already getting strong. You're getting defensive, and your sister seems to be angry. You're in a crucial conversation, and it's not going well. Start with heart. Ask yourself what you really want. You want to be compensated fairly for the extra time and money you put in that your sister didn't. You also want to keep a good relationship with your sister, but you want to avoid making a fool's choice. So you ask yourself, how can I tell her that I want to be compensated fairly for the extra effort and expense I put in and keep a good relationship? Learn to look. You recognize a lack of mutual purpose. You're both trying to defend your actions rather than discuss the estate. Make it safe. Contrast to help your sister understand your purpose. You. I don't want to start an argument or try to make you feel guilty, but I do want to talk about being compensated for shouldering most of the responsibility over the last few years. I love Mom, but it put quite a strain on me financially and emotionally. Sister. What makes you think you did so much more than I did? Master my stories. You're telling yourself that you deserve more because you did more to care for your mother and covered unplanned expenses. 
Retrace your path to action to find out what facts are behind the story you're telling that's making you angry. State my path. You need to share your facts and conclusions with your sister in a way that will make her feel safe telling her story. You. It's just that I spent a lot of money taking care of mom and did a lot of work caring for her instead of bringing in a nurse. I know you cared about mom too, but I honestly feel like I did more in the day-to-day -day caregiving than you did, and it only seems fair to use some of what she left us to repay a part of what I spent. Do you see it differently? I'd really like to hear. Sister. Okay, fine. Why don't you just send me a bill? It sounds as though your sister isn't really okay with this arrangement. You can tell her voice is tense and her tone is one of giving in, not of true agreement. Explore others' paths. Since part of your objective is to maintain a good relationship with your sister, it's important that she add her meaning to the pool. Use the inquiry skills to actively explore her views. You. The way you say that makes it sound like Maybe that suggestion isn't okay with you. Notice you're mirroring here. Is there something I'm missing? Now you're asking. Sister. No. If you feel like you deserve more than I do, you're probably right. You. Do you think I'm being unfair? That I'm not acknowledging your contributions? Notice that now you're priming. Sister. It's just that I know I wasn't around much in the last couple of years. I've had to travel a lot for work, but I still visited whenever I could, and I sent money every month to help contribute to Mom's care. I offered to help pay to bring in a nurse if you thought it was necessary. I didn't know you felt you had an unfair share of the responsibility, and it seems like you're asking for more money is coming out of nowhere. You. So you feel like you were doing everything you could do to help out and are surprised that I feel like I should be compensated? Now you're paraphrasing. Sister. Well. Yes. Explore others' paths. You understand your sister's story now and still disagree to a point. Use the ABC skills to explain how your view differs. You agree in part with how your sister sees things. Use building to emphasize what you agree with and to bring up what you differ on. You. You're right. You did a lot to help out, and I realized that it was expensive to visit as often as you did. I opted not to pay for professional home health care because Mom was more comfortable with me taking care of her, and I didn't mind that. On top of that, there were some incidental expenses it doesn't sound like you were aware of. The new medication she was on during the last 18 months was twice as expensive as the old, and the insurance only covered a percentage of her hospital stays. It adds up. Sister, so it's these expenses you're worried about covering? Could we go over these expenses to decide how to cover them? Move to action. You want to create a definite plan for being reimbursed for these expenses, and you want it to be one you both agree on. Come to a consensus about what will happen, and document who does what by when, and settle on a way to follow up. You. I've kept a record of all the expenses that went over the amount that both of us agreed to contribute. Can we sit down tomorrow to go over those and talk about what's fair to reimburse me for? Sister. Okay. We'll talk about the estate and write up a plan for how to divide things up. My Crucial Conversation Afton P. During the summer of 2004, my husband secured a coveted internship in Geneva, Switzerland, working for the United Nations. While we were there, I befriended the Geneva representative for a non-governmental organization for women. She was gearing up for the upcoming subcommission on the promotion and protection of human rights. Believing in the importance of this committee's work, I became involved in their efforts to seek UN support to prevent human rights abuses to children. The focus was on child abduction and safety, and specifically the oppression of religious expression, child soldiers, and young girls being sold into sex slavery. These abhorrent practices were being largely ignored by officials of some countries. As the committee got to work planning the report we would present to the subcommission, I became concerned about what was and wasn't being shared. It was strongly suggested by the committee chair of our non-governmental organization that we avoid mentioning specific country names where the grievances were taking place. As a 22-year-old student not steeped in politics, I asked, why not? The committee said they had to take extreme caution not to offend certain country officials who looked the other way regarding these abuses for fear of damaging relationships. 
I was in a predicament. I wanted to promote real change, but I believed our report would hold little weight if we just talked in general terms, and I was afraid of losing a powerful opportunity in this forum. I immediately thought about the book Crucial Conversations and was kicking myself for not having brought it with me. Who knew I'd need it on my summer abroad in Switzerland? Thankfully, I remembered the basics, and I drew on its principles as I expressed my belief that it was possible to be both candid and respectful in presenting delicate information. To my surprise, they invited me to rewrite the report. I was thrilled, but also terrified about the potential harm I could cause if I wasn't very careful in addressing people from many nations with diverse cultures. I spent almost every waking hour and several sleepless nights trying to carefully script an honest yet respectful portrayal of the issues by stating the facts and focusing on a mutual purpose, human rights for suffering children. The committee agreed my version was more forthright and showed appropriate sensitivity. The surprises continued. Ten days before the presentation, the committee asked me to present the report to the subcommittee. I was both shocked and honored. Although this brought my anxiety level to a new peak, I immediately agreed to do it, and I spent the next several days and sleepless nights preparing for the event. When my turn finally came to deliver the report, I felt exhilarated and a little anxious. After I finished presenting, it appeared many in the audience were moved, and a few even had tears in their eyes. Others hurried over to ask me for a copy of my speech for networking and documenting purposes. As they approached, some were emotional and many thanked me for raising the sensitive issues. I learned many lessons through this experience, but one that stands out is the importance of realizing it is possible to be both candid and respectful with the right set of skills. Knowledge of crucial conversation skills helped me turn an intimidating experience into a memorable and meaningful opportunity to stand up for something I believed in. Afton P. Conclusion It's not about communication, it's about results. Let's end where we started. We began this book by suggesting we got dragged somewhat unwillingly into the topic of communication. What we were most interested in was not writing a book on communication. Rather, we wanted to identify crucial moments, moments when people's actions disproportionately affect their organizations, their relationships, and their lives. Our research led us time and again to focus on moments when people need to step up to emotionally and politically risky conversations. That's why we came to call these moments crucial conversations. The current quality of your leadership and your life is fundamentally a function of how you are presently handling these moments. Our sole motivation in writing this book has been to help you profoundly improve the results you care about most. And our dearest hope, as we conclude it, is that you will do so. Take action. Identify a crucial conversation you could improve now. Use the tools in this last chapter to identify the principle or skills that will help you approach it in a more effective way than you ever have. Then give it a try. One thing our research shows clearly is that you need not be perfect to make progress. You needn't worry if you make only stuttering progress. We promise you that if you persist and work at these ideas, you will see dramatic improvement in your relationships and results. These moments are truly crucial, and a little bit of change can lead to an enormous amount of progress. Afterward what I've learned about crucial conversations in the past 10 years. The greatest discovery of my generation is that a human being can alter his life by altering his attitudes of mind. William James In this chapter, we, the authors, will step out of our collective voice and talk to you personally. Since Crucial Conversations was first published in 2002, We've traveled millions of miles around the world and addressed hundreds of thousands of people to share our research and advice on these vital skills. Needless to say, we've learned as much as anyone from interacting with the many people who have struggled in the same way we have struggled to turn these ideas into habits and attempted to use them to enrich their lives and strengthen their organizations. In this afterward, we'll share a reflection or two about how our thinking has changed over the past decade through our conversations and experiences with readers like you and in our own life challenges as well. First, here's Al Switzler. 
I've said for years that crucial conversation skills are only applicable if you live or work with or near other people. Now, that's a broad statement, and it applies equally to me. During these last 10 years, I've had my share of challenges, a few failures, and a number of successes. And from all of these, I've learned a thing or two. I'm going to share a few incidents that happened to me and the lessons that I learned. Number one, I've been to the airport hundreds of times. I know how the system works. On one particular day, I went to the airport to pick up my wife. I had the perfect plan to pay nothing for parking, and if everything worked, I would be in and out of the parking lot in less than 30 minutes. I arrived according to plan. I met and hugged Linda. I got her luggage in my truck, and I sped to the exit. I knew I was under 30 minutes. And then the parking attendant said, $3. I asked to see my ticket, and it read 29 minutes. And I noted that this should be free. I noted it again and again, that it should be free. Again and again, and by now my wife was discreetly elbowing me. I asked to talk to the manager who said that his computer was accurate and that the ticket was wrong. I wasn't very nice. I paid the $3 and left. And here's the lesson. We teach that when it matters the most, we often do our worst. I've learned that sometimes when it hardly matters at all, we can do our worst. There is no cruise control for crucial conversations, and we need to be alert all the time. Since then, I've practiced noticing my early warning signs, and I've learned that I can catch problems with myself early. Number two. A few years ago, a lady came up after a keynote and asked me to sign her book. This was an amazing book. It was the most underlined, tabbed, and dog-eared book I had ever seen. And as I signed it, I commented that the book looked well used. She agreed that she had used it, and at my prodding, she told me, about bringing up issues with her boss, with her brother-in-law, with other departments where she worked. This was great. I said, you've shared so many great stories. I'm not sure what your position in the company is. Are you the head of HR or chief operating officer? She looked at me as though I didn't get it. And then she said very nicely, you don't get it. I work in IT. Position doesn't matter. Crucial conversations belong to the first person who sees them. I don't solve the issues. I just make sure they are brought up in a safe way. And here's the lesson. What a great lesson. You don't have to solve the issues. You just have to own it if you see it and bring it up in a safe way. There are a lot of people who are teaching me new lessons about crucial conversations all the time. Now, this is Joseph Grenny. I'll share some of my reflections. I got miffed at my 15-year-old son a couple of weeks ago. Now, I need to tell you that Hiram is one of the finest young men you could meet. He is as honest as the day is long. He is smart, kind, clever, and as industrious as they come. I love this boy. And yet I found myself seething at him. In the moment, I felt he was rude, cold, ungrateful, and manipulative. At least that was my story about him. That story generated a potent emotion that was threatening to cause me to say something hurtful to him. He wasn't behaving the way I wanted him to. And in the zeal of the moment, I felt an insane certainty that a well-aimed tirade might help him reform his life beginning this instant. In fact, I felt it was my moral duty as a loving parent to lay into him. Well, this embarrassing moment exemplifies one of the things I have become most conscious of in the last 10 years. I've become more and more aware of, first, how true emotions can feel during crucial moments, and second, how false they really are. I've learned to be suspicious of my convictions during these moments of strong emotion and more confident that if I use the tools I've learned, I can create an entirely different set of emotions. The second thing I've learned over and over again is how much these emotions can corrupt my view of those closest to me. When I'm in the grip of victim, villain, and helpless stories, when my motives degenerate and I'm driven by a desperate need to be right, I don't see others as they really are. Even my precious son can look like a monster. As my brain tried to force an unhelpful sentence out of my mouth, aimed at the heart of my son, I did what we've advised you to do in similar circumstances. I asked myself, what do I really want? I challenged my story. I asked myself, 
Why would a reasonable, rational, decent person do what Hiram had just done? I examined my role. In a matter of seconds, I started to feel muscles in my chest relax. My shoulders dropped a full two inches. My hands unclenched. But most important, my heart did too. As this happened, Hiram literally transformed in front of me. He was no longer a monster. He was a vulnerable, beautiful, precious boy. Whereas moments earlier, I was thoroughly convinced my view of him was just and true. I now had an entirely different view that I felt even more was just and true. Our emotions are incredibly plastic. In crucial moments, they are almost always wrong. With practice, though, we can gain incredible power to change them. And as we change them, not only do we learn to change how we see those around us, but we learn to change our very lives as well. Now let's hear from Carrie Patterson. After a decade of talking with people who've read Crucial Conversations, I'm always surprised at the number of individuals who suggest that the book has helped them immensely, yet when I ask them what specific part has been of most assistance, they hesitantly explain that they haven't exactly read the entire book. As I press further, many indicate that they haven't read much of the book at all. Okay, they've only scanned the book. But somehow the title, cover, headers, and first few pages have served them well, and they aren't kidding. A quick glance has helped them enormously. How could this be? As I probe further, I learned that the simple idea that some conversations are so important that they deserve a special title and special treatment reminds individuals that as they step up to high-stakes conversations, they ought to be careful. Instead of becoming frightened or upset and then degenerating into their worst selves, they ought to bring their best conversation skills into play. It's not as if your typical readers are bereft of communication skills. They weren't raised by wolves. When a discussion digresses, they can listen better. That they get. They can be thoughtful and pleasant, and they can most assuredly avoid harsh language and terse accusations. All of this, of course, is within their current skill set. This means that readers don't have to study every concept and skill contained in this book before they risk speaking their mind. Many come armed with communication skills. And now, after a brief exposure to the book, they'll be even better prepared. More specifically, if they'll simply note when they're entering a crucial conversation and then do their best to avoid transmuting into a troglodyte, they'll be just that much more likely to succeed. The reason I find this response so refreshing is because it offers so much hope. You don't have to read every syllable contained in this book, go into intense training for months, and then emerge with the minimum skill set to survive a crucial conversation. When it comes to high-stakes conversations and emotional conversations, it's not an all-or-nothing proposition. For some readers, a simple reminder that they have moved from a casual discussion to a crucial conversation helps them be on their best behavior. For others, the idea that they can catch themselves going to silence or violence, apologize, and start over helps get them back on track, even when they started off on the wrong foot. Some have found that restoring safety now permeates their every interaction. Still others find value in not telling ugly stories. Of course, learning and applying more communication skills better prepares one for a variety of situations. However, if you want to get started with crucial conversations, grab but one idea from this book and bring it into your next high-stakes interaction. It may be just what you need to find a way to speak your mind and make it safe for others to do the same. And finally, let's hear from Ron McMillan. I'd like to share a couple things I've learned since we wrote the book Crucial Conversations. If you do everything we tell you to do in this book exactly the way we tell you to do it, and the other person doesn't want a dialogue, you won't. <laughs> These skills are not techniques for controlling others. They're not tools for manipulating behavior or eliminating others' agency. These skills have limits and do not guarantee that other people will behave in exactly the way you desire. Bummer. <laughs> Consider another lesson. We're tempted to think of a crucial conversation as my one chance to solve this problem or as the one conversation needed to save a relationship, or as the one opportunity to make everything right. What if instead we see the single crucial conversation as the beginning of a dialogue, the first of many toward making a negative relationship positive, the first of many necessary to right a wrong? What if we seek not to have just a conversation based on mutual purpose and mutual respect, 
but rather a rich relationship based on these conditions. To see these principles and skills as ways of building relationships, teams, and families. The wisest use of these skills is to develop habits, lives, and loves, not to use them just occasionally in single interactions. Years ago, I had serious concerns about one of my teenage daughters. She'd always been a straight-A student, but then her grades tanked. She started bringing home C's and D's. Her grooming degraded. After school, instead of hanging out with her friends, she stayed in her room alone. I knew something was very wrong. My repeated efforts, using my very best skills to get her to talk, were rebuffed with icy silence or sullen one-word replies. When she did initiate a conversation, it was only to complain or make a sarcastic comment. It would be easy to see these crucial conversations with my daughter as failures. Not a single one created a dialogue with her or solved a problem. And yet, consistently applied principles can have a strong influence over time. Every heartfelt attempt on my part to talk with her made it safer for her. Each time I replied to her sarcastic remarks with respect, Safety was nurtured. Every time I stopped probing before she felt overwhelmed, I showed respect for her privacy. When I shared my good intentions and offered to be of help, her negative stories softened. Then came the memorable moment. After several weeks of patient effort, when she felt safe enough, she approached me, shared her problem, and asked for my help. Our conversation created understanding and options and gave her the resolve to pursue them. If you use these skills exactly the way we tell you to and the other person doesn't want a dialogue, you won't dialogue. However, if you persist over time, refusing to take offense, making your motives genuine, showing respect, and constantly searching for mutual purpose, then the other person almost always will join you in dialogue. This is Joseph Grenny from McGraw-Hill Professional. Thank you for listening. This audiobook is copyrighted in 2012 in the name of Carrie Patterson, Joseph Grenny, Ron McMillan, and Al Switzler, and is based upon the book Crucial Conversations, second edition, by Carrie Patterson, Joseph Grenny, Ron McMillan, and Al Switzler, copyrighted in 2012 in the name of Carrie Patterson, Joseph Grenny, Ron McMillan, and Al Switzler. To purchase other McGraw-Hill Professional audiobooks, please visit Amazon.com. To purchase other McGraw-Hill Professional products, please visit our website at www.mhprofessional.com. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.